those who are with us today, especially those that are visiting with us. Thank you for coming our way and hope that you'll feel welcome and hope that you'll come back whenever you have an opportunity. And we hope that the lesson, that you'll take your Bible and follow very closely. If you have any questions about anything that I present, I would welcome you to take me aside and we'll talk about those things further. I want to talk uh, about a little bit of an extension, I guess it would be, because I think um, Andrew presented a very good lesson this morning, very foundational. In fact, it makes some of the most foundational points. The emphasis in the book of Colossians, for example, is hold to the head, hold tightly to the head who is Jesus. And that would mean that he's got all the authority and you, you let him be the one that directs you and holds, and you hold yourself accountable to him. Do not let yourself be cheated by allowing your mind to be taken captive by false teaching. Might be in the form of philosophy. Philosophy of men can captivate you and, and dazzle you and entertain you and take you away from the head, Jesus Christ. You might also want to reach back and captivate some of the things that were part of the Mosaic law. He says, don't let, somebody, don't let anybody judge you in regard to foods and festivals and new moons and Sabbaths and those kind of things. We're not under the law of Moses. We are under Christ. And therefore, don't let anybody cheat you by bringing you back under that law that didn't have saving power in itself anyway to start with. And so, you are to hold fast to the head, the one who has the power to save you, who has the gospel that saves, that has the power to save you, and don't allow yourself to be cheated of the reward that you are to have. Don't let imaginations captivate you. You can be guided by uh, misguided uh, imaginations. Sometimes people think worshiping of angels, that would certainly, that would seem to me to mean that we are just more religious than you are. He says that may have an appearance of wisdom, but don't let that captivate you either because that's, that didn't come from Jesus. Jesus didn't tell you to worship angels. And so it's all got to come from Jesus. And that's the great point of the lesson this morning, and I appreciate it so much because it lays a good foundation for what I'm going to talk about. In Acts chapter 2, we begin the Lord's church. He promised to build it. And when He promised to build it, He didn't just throw it out there and say, now you take over and whatever you want to be a part of that, then, then we'll just go with that. That wasn't the nature of that church. So we look in the New Testament and we try to understand what the Lord's church was like and therefore what it must be today. In the chapter that we just mentioned, Acts chapter 2, we see them being baptized into Christ. Every one of them that were gladly received Peter's word were baptized. And then they, it says, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That means they had a body of teaching that they held to. And they continued steadfastly listening and, and devouring everything that the apostles would teach them. In Acts chapter 20, Paul got with the Ephesian elders and just poured his heart out because he was concerned about the future of the church. And he says, when I was with you, I did not shun to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I told you everything God expected of you. The whole counsel means every bit of it. Now, they didn't have it all in written form, but they had it audibly in oral form, and so they could remember it, and if they worked at it, they could, they could remember this is what the apostles taught us. And somebody came along and started teaching a little bit different than that, then they would say, wait a minute now, the apostles didn't teach us this. So, it was continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine that Paul says is very important to you Ephesian elders because he says there are going to be people who are going to want to tweak things a little bit and to change things. Now, I want to tell you, I told you everything. 
And if, they, if anybody comes in, even among the eldership, if anybody comes in and preaches any other thing than what we preach, then you not to, you're not to accept it. You're to compare it to what we taught you to start with. So the apostles' doctrine was looked at right off the bat, immediately. It didn't wait till Catholicism came along and, and somebody says, the Catholics gave us the Bible. No, they didn't. The whole counsel of God was in place long before Roman Catholicism started developing. Now, they might have acknowledged what was already known, and that was that the apostles' teaching were the inspired writings. They might have given some acknowledgement to that fact, but they didn't invent that fact. The whole counsel of God was delivered orally so people could remember what the apostles taught. And then by the end of the first century, I believe before A.D. 70, every bit of the New Testament was written. Every bit of it. Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 10 says, If somebody comes along and they preach any other gospel than what we preach. See, that's the standard. That's the complete standard. If they preach any other gospel than what we preach, even if an angel did it, don't listen to an angel. That's just how important it was that they, that they be very particular and very careful about the apostles' doctrine. And Paul wrote to Timothy twice, and both of those letters, every one of us need to read those letters to Timothy because they're basically saying this, don't let anybody come in and tamper with it. Don't let anybody tweak it. Don't let anybody teach anything other than what we taught. In fact, he says the Scriptures completely furnish the man of God to every good work so that there's nothing missing from the Scriptures. Everything that you need is going to be right there. And John writes the same thing. He says, if somebody doesn't bring this doctrine, don't receive him into your house. Well, how would they know if they're teaching? Well, they've got the doctrine that had been taught by the apostles. And so they were to use that, and they were to remember the apostles gave us the whole thing. They didn't leave anything out. It's all there. And the scriptures that were delivered through the apostles and prophets of Jesus Christ have delivered to us a New Testament. And everything that you need is right there in the New Testament. Now let's remember that point because if that's so, then the simplicity of that early church that didn't have popes and cardinals and monks and nuns and all of those things that were added later... They didn't have any of that. It was just a very simple form in that first century church. It was so simple that you can sum it up in Acts 2 verse 42 says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles and the doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. That's pretty simple. Very simple form of worship. They could do it anywhere. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 4, He says, Now the hour is coming when you're not going to worship in Jerusalem because, you see, Jerusalem, temple, all of that, that's going to be replaced. All of that was to point to a spiritual time and the time of reformation. And the Apostles' Doctrine taught all about that, that we were not going to carry forward all of those carnal things that they used, the burning of incense and the animal sacrifices and the instrumental music and all of those things that were associated with that temple worship there in Jerusalem. All of that's going to be discarded because he says God is going to be looking for true worshipers to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, with that in mind, let's try to understand how important it was when Paul wrote to Timothy. He says, there's coming a time when men will not be able to endure sound doctrine. They don't want it anymore. They're kind of tired of it. And it's always been the case. You can look at the history of God's people in the Old Testament. And you can see a little bit of it happening in the New Testament as well. 
there's always been that tendency of people to get tired of staying with that same old, same old. People have always tired of God's way and got tired and yearned for new and different things. And we're not talking about just different ways of doing what's right, but just something entirely different. And so what people have done, and Paul warns Timothy, is that they will chop chop themselves off of a slice of their own teaching and start something that is entirely new and different because they could not endure sound doctrine. There was a pattern, and he told Timothy, he said, to hold fast, hold tightly to the pattern of sound words because people are going to come and they can't endure sound doctrine. So the the apostles over and over, I, I, I was trying to think, the book of Romans, he's dealing with false teaching. 1 Corinthians, he's dealing with little deviations here and there. Divisions, carnality, immorality coming into the church. And then forcing upon the members teachings of men that maybe had been a part of the law of Moses. Or, and tweaking and perverting the Lord's Supper. And, and then doing things spontaneously instead of in, in decency and in order. And then perverting the teaching of the resurrection. It, that those were little things, but a bunch of little things. The book of Galatians is wholly about Paul's great concern about the deviations. And really all you started with in Acts chapter 15 was somebody saying, well, if you're going to invite the Jew, Gentiles to come into the church, we started by circumcision and then we kept the law of Moses and then we were added to the Lord's church. And so if the Gentiles are going to be a part of the church, then they need to be circumcised. And and so they were just trying to add a little thing and the apostles got together and they debated and they talked back and forth in Acts chapter 15. And they says, well, here's what we taught at the beginning. We never said that, did we? We never taught that. And if we never taught it, then that means it wasn't a part of what the Lord wants. And so he says, then this issue ought to be settled. As far as the Gentiles are concerned, we're not going to lay that kind of burden on them. We didn't keep it when we did have it. And it was a burden to us then. And we're certainly not going to put a burden on them that we ourselves did not keep. So his concern was that if we, let, if we open the door by letting somebody come in and say, you've got to be circumcised, then we've opened the door that's going to mean the next fellow is going to come in saying, now you got to keep these days and you got to keep these months and you got to keep these years. All of that was also part of the law of Moses. You you brought circumcision in and we got to bring these other things in. You see, they they saw the problem with the very first step in the apostasy that was going on. And the first one was, as we said, circumcision being bound. That doesn't seem like a lot. Why should that? But every letter, just about every letter has their concern about that. In fact, in Galatians chapter 5, he says, uh, he says, circumcision is nothing. I mean, now in Christ Jesus, circumcision is nothing. Chapter 5, verse 6. In Christ Jesus, things are different. Everything is new. And we're not following the Old Testament law with all of its types and shadows and all of those things. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avail. It doesn't matter either way because God is not binding that into this New Testament. The only thing that matters is a faith that is working through love, through goodwill, and that would keep us then on a steady course. In the reading just a moment ago that Nolan read in 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at this. Have you ever thought about the fact that the way we look at things today, a lot of people look at it and say, well, that's just a little bit. Y'all make too much about little bitty things. 
Well, he says the Spirit says expressly that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to, to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. That is, they don't come, these doctrines do not come from God. He says they speak lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron among the doctrines of demons. You would think, doctrine of demons, that's a pretty hard word, hard word. He said, that's the doctrine of demons. It didn't come from God, then where did it come from? Well, it came from the demons. It's a doctrine of demons. What is it? Well, here's an example, verse 3. Forbidding to marry. That's a doctrine of demons. I don't know how many times we, 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 have, uh, we have looked at that verse and then we ran right across it without acknowledging the fact. He says, now, I don't, you may think that's just a little bitty thing, but it, it's a doctrine of demons. A lot of people look at it, well, what we do is, you know, we were like Paul. Paul didn't, uh, he didn't marry. So you don't have to marry. Well, that's true, you don't have to marry. But the point is, the doctrine of demons says, now, this group of people can't marry. That's what he's saying. You've, they're forbidden to. You know, like, like some of the, uh, the Catholic priests today, they would certainly like to get married, but their doctrine tells them they can't and they mustn't. Well, that's doctrine of demons. Didn't come from God, it came from the demonic world. Now, if you open that door to one doctrine of demons, you've opened the door, you've opened the, the crack so that. How many is going to be before, how many doctrines do we need before we plug the hole up? You see, here's another one. And commanding to abstain from foods. Somebody says, well, what's the big deal with that? That is because it didn't come from God. It came from the demons. Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats. I knew when I was a little boy who had... Uh, Fish Friday, <laughs> because there was, there was some church ordinance in, the, in Catholicism that, that forbade eating of pork or, or steak or something like that, but fish was okay. <laughs> I'd wonder, well, that's me. <laughs> why, why, is it, why is it this doctrine in place? Where did it come from? Well, Paul says it came from demons. God created foods to be received with thanksgiving, if you, know, if you believe the truth. So, he, he puts the truth over here. He says, here's the truth, and then here's the doctrine of demons. Now, that sounds serious because, number one, if it didn't come from God, it's wrong. Jesus asked the Pharisees, where did the baptism of John come from? Did it, did it come from heaven or did it come from men? The Pharisees began to reason and say, well, now if we say it came from heaven, and then, the, then he's going to get on to us and say, well, why didn't you do it then? And if we say from men, then the people are going to get on to us because they think John was a prophet and it must have come from God. So they were in a, they were in a bad position. They hadn't been baptized by John. And the point I'm making is, is that Jesus acknowledged you either going to get something from God or you're going to get it from man, and man gets it from demons. That's really the only two places you can get things. So you got to be very, very careful because the apostles were very concerned about these deviations, these doctrines of demons, and these doctrines of men. Doctrines of men kind of add things in there that distort what was originally taught by the apostles. And then we mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Corinthians were perverting the Lord's Supper, turning it into some kind of common meal. And he got on to them about that. And he said, I can't praise you in this. I can't. The reason he couldn't is because they were perverting what the Lord originally taught and changing it. You can't do that. That's the doctrines of men, doctrines of demons. Losing an orderly assembly just to be for the, the pride of, of spontaneity. We just want to be spontaneous. Well, if you do that, then you're going to lose order. 
And we've got to keep order. Losing order at the expense or losing order just for spontaneity uh, is not pleasing to God. So we've got to be careful about that. Little bitty steps in the first century like, I mean, it's an innocent thing. I, I think we, our elders probably would handle things uh, similar to this, that maybe at this particular meeting, uh, Darren might preside. I mean, he'd just be the one that kind of gets things going, kind of controls the direction. Next time, though, they might switch it around. But if you keep the same one and he becomes designated as the presiding elder, and then he becomes a special elder. That then is a little bitty step that was okay to start with, but then it kind of stepped off a little bit. Now you've got a presiding elder. This is the one who's in the special position. That may seem like a small step, but it's a step that opens the door to the next step, because if you take that step, then you've got another step you can take. And you got a step that goes into the direction of recognizing somebody kind of overarches all the other bishops or deacons or, or elders in this case. See those little steps. Steps are in the wrong direction was what the apostles were concerned about. Did we teach that? Can you prove that we taught that? Can you go back to our teaching and say, here's what the apostles taught? You see, that's very, very important. Now, the reason I'm saying all of that is because we're asking the question and, a- and hopefully answering it. In the first century, you had the simplicity of the apostles' doctrine. And then sometime down the road, you've got something that looks just, I mean, it's a monstrosity. It looks like we've, we've added some things that came out of the Old Testament, <laughs> And it looks like we've added some things that go directly in conflict with the New Testament. So obviously the New Testament wasn't the product of Catholicism. They would have certainly put popes and cardinals and, and uh, uh, a lot more Hail Marys in there and, and a lot of other things in there that you don't find in the New Testament. What they did is they acknowledged the fact that the 27 books that we have that was already recognized by early Christians, they just recognized that in their own way. Because they couldn't do otherwise. They had already proven themselves. They had proven themselves since the first century. So it wasn't the fact, it it wasn't that the Catholics gave us the New Testament. They didn't. If they had given it to us, if it would come from them, it would have been totally different. It had a lot more things in it than's in there. And a lot of things that are in there, they'd have tweaked that and thrown that away. So what we do is we're looking at the New Testament and we see that they weren't, they weren't adopting all these types and shadows from the Old Testament. They got rid of all of those things. It was a time of reformation. And now they were, instead of having a physical temple, they have a spiritual temple. Instead of having physical sacrifices, they are offering spiritual sacrifices. Instead of burning incense, they are offering up prayers and those, th- those kinds of good deeds that smell good to God. But those, those are not physical objects. They are not physical carnal things anymore. And so what you see then is that they left off those carnal things that were pointing to something spiritual in the New Testament. And then out the other end, when we get to Rome, we're getting a bunch of these things added back in. So when we look at the New Testament, we see the Christians having an inward cross. They weren't wearing a gold chain with a medallion around their neck. They were just, they had an inward understanding. They had an inward cross that they understood And somewhere between the simplicity of what was inside their heart, inside their mind, inside their faith, we get to Rome where Roman Catholicism over a period of time stands today with a claim that they go all the way back to the first century. But they don't. You see, what was happening is an accumulation of little bitty small changes, little bitty steps one little step here 
And that opened the door for another step until we got from Jerusalem the simplicity that you read about in the Bible to the complexity of the cathedral in Rome. Now, with that in mind, I'd like us to understand the Apostles' Doctrine was the complete standard. It had everything in it. If, we, if they wanted popes, they would have been somewhere mentioned in the New Testament. If we wanted cardinals, there would have been something mentioned about that. They were concerned about those deviations. And they called them doctrines of demons. They did not... In fact, look at... I'm looking at, uh, in the New Testament at the book of 2 Thessalonians. I want you to notice in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2... And look at verse 3. He says, like he said to the Colossians this morning as we were studying, he says, Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. In other words, there's going to be a falling away from the apostles' doctrine. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is somebody who's claiming the position of God. Now, I don't know if it is specifically talking about the Pope of Rome. I'm not I'm not claiming that that's exactly it. I'm just saying here that if somebody sits and they're saying, I'm standing in the place of Jesus, I'm standing in the place of God, then this tells us you better, you better, you better steer away from that. Because somebody is showing himself that he is God or that he's a vicar or some kind of special representative and, and all authority of Jesus is wrapped up in that man, then he says, you better be very careful. Do you remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things. And now you know what is restraining. What's restraining that from happening? Well, it's only those Preachers and those memories of what the apostles preached, those were the restraining factors that was holding it back. But you get the apostles out of the way, and you get those conscientious preachers and teachers of God's Word of the New Testament, you get them out of the way, then the, then the floodgate is open and the falling away is going to occur. And now you know what's restraining, that He may be revealed in His own time. For the mystery of lawlessness, listen to this, is already. Right then when the apostles were teaching, he says it's the mystery of lawlessness. That is going without law, going outside the boundaries of law. He says all of that is already at work. It's already at work. So would it be surprising then that in the second century we see a lot more changes? And in the 3rd century, we see even more changes. And by the 4th century, we've got a lot of changes from the Apostles' Doctrine. And where did they come from? Well, the demons knew if we can get the foot in the door, if they'll, if they'll add circumcision, ah, we can add more things from the Law of Moses back in here. If we'll, if we'll let just one doctrine of men... In, then we can let more doctrines of men in. You see, that's the way it works. And then you get people who are tired of the truth. There's what we call, or what Paul referred to, or what I think I, I heard some preacher term it this way, the itching ear syndrome. That's from what Paul wrote. He said that they will have itching ears, and they'll want somebody to scratch it. And somebody will say, oh, you need your ear scratched. I can, I, can, I can scratch it. That's the itching ear syndrome when you're tired of the truth. Then somebody will tell you what you're itching to hear. The itching ear syndrome is a step in the direction that gets us from the simplicity of Jerusalem to the complexity that we see in the Roman Catholic 
organization. Teachers willing to tickle. And as we saw this morning, some seeking a special stimulant of some kind of outward stimulant, some way of expressing themselves in a way that, that appeases their own pride and vanity. They're seeking some kind of outward stimulant. And when you do that, you cut off the voices of those who are willing to stay with the truth. The way to Rome was away from Jerusalem above. The Jerusalem that came down with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and filled the apostles with the doctrine from heaven. The way to Rome is to forget Jerusalem above has come down in the apostles' teaching. Now let's consider those Steps from Jerusalem to Rome. Someone said that the steps of apostasy were small but accumulative over time. They were. Like we said a while ago, a little thing like forbidding to marry, then commanding to abstain from meats. And somebody says, What's the big deal with that? And so everybody says, well, that's no big deal. Let's go ahead with that. And so we all go along with that. It was small, but it was accumulative. It was all that the, that the demons knew was needed. Small steps. But once you make that first one, it's logical. Once you step out here, if I step out here, it's logical did I take another one? Isn't, that's only logical. It's not logical for me to step there and just leave this one here. It's logical for me to stay, take the next step. And that's the way it is. From Jerusalem to Rome, they seem pretty logical, like presiding elder to archbishop. Seemingly successful. We start measuring by how many people are pleased, how many people we get, how many people seem interested now. We're seemingly successful. We we start measuring ourselves by ourselves. And Paul says, that's not wise. What about... Some of those churches that were faithful to God, but they, they stayed with the doctrine of Christ. Yeah, but they weren't growing. Well, they may not have been growing numerically, but they were growing. They were growing the way it counts with God. So, you've got you to measure things. I, I remember one time when I was growing up, I used to measure, and this was, a, this was foolish now. Look how foolish this is. We would measure... Look how the Mormons do. I mean, they really get out. They got these guys riding the street, bicycles, white shirts. And, and look what all they do. Why don't we do that? Well, number one, we don't have anybody that's going to organize all that. Number two, the Mormon elder, he's going to be doing that. He's not an elder to start with. He's too young. But he's been told that he can be an elder. So he's not going to tell the truth about that. Second of all, he's only going to dedicate two years to it, and then he's scot-free the rest of his life. And then you got somebody that's going to pay his education if he dedicates that. So the Lord's Church doesn't have organization like that. The Lord's Church never needed that kind of organization. It's unwise for us to start comparing ourselves to an organization that doesn't abide by the rules. Here's an organization, the Lord's Church, trying to abide by the rules. And we're making a comparison with an organization that has no rules. You can't do that. That's not even reasonable. So, don't measure ourselves by human standards. But we do need to measure ourselves by God's standards. And God's standards... Are that we hold fast the pattern of sound words. Hold fast to it. 
Another thing you notice, they were always appealing to human vanity. Look at our temple. Look at our building. Look at the icons we have. Look how impressive this is. The early churches could meet anywhere. They didn't have to set up and stage things. They, they could meet in somebody's house the whole time. They could meet in the schoolhouse for three years. I mean, they, they, you didn't stage the production. And so they were the steps in the direction of appeasing human vanity. Those are the things, those are the steps that take you to Rome and away from Jerusalem. They were away from divine authority, as was pointed out well in the lesson this morning, where Jesus is the head over everything to the church. Now he's head of some things, and we've got some things. Where we are predicted to depart from the faith. And while we're departing, we don't think we are. Nobody, when they depart from the faith, thinks that they departed from the faith. Isn't that something? Even when Demas forsook Paul, having loved this present world, Demas, do you think you're abandoning the right way? No. He probably would have said no. It's in man's mind to take the predictions of apostasy and say uh, that might apply over there, but it never applies over here. Small steps from Jerusalem to Rome. And what the New Testament, what the apostles wept about, what they cried about, what they warned about night and day with tears was we don't want you to go to Rome. And I'm not talking about physically. Paul wanted to go to Rome and preach the gospel. But I'm talking about in the sense of of moving from the simplicity of the Lord's church as it was established in Jerusalem and then coming out with things that are just completely different than that. We need to stay with Jerusalem from above. We need to always be checking ourselves, making sure I can endure sound doctrine. In fact, I not only endure it, I want it. And I fully expect it. I demand it. I don't want anything less than that. Staying with Jerusalem above. That's what we're talking about. Where you really believe Christ is all sufficient and you believe that all the information that you can know about Christ is not imagined but comes from revelation so that you read it and you know what Christ was about and what his will is. Where you believe that he's all sufficient but the only thing I can know about him And what his will is, is right there in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. To the Colossians, he says, now the goal is for Christ to be all in all. That is every member. If we can get every member who believes that too, that Christ is everything to me. And then you got a hundred and two hundred, how many? I don't remember, but how many ever we've got here, every member says Christ is all I need. You preach Christ, you prove to me that you're preaching the will of Christ, I'll support what you're saying and I'll support what you're doing for the cause of Jesus Christ. But if you deviate, I'm going to hold you responsible and I'm going to tell you you didn't. You didn't teach the word of Christ. Where Christ is head over all things to the church. That is, as far as the church is concerned, He has all authority, and we do not have any. And whereas the church is concerned, we get into trouble 
when we deviate from the head and so hold fast to the head. Don't let anybody cheat you through philosophy from the doctrines of men. In Galatians, I'd like you to notice Galatians chapter 4. And notice with me, starting with verse 8, Galatians 4 verse 8. He says, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those who by nature are not gods. That was your religion. But now after you have known God, and of course they knew God through the gospel, or rather are known by God, that is God has now known you in a spiritual way so that you're his children. How is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. Those were things that came out of the law of Moses. He says, I am afraid for you. Brethren, let's, let's have that kind of fear. I'm afraid for brethren. I'm afraid for them. I'm afraid for myself. I'm afraid for people when they start down a path that they can't prove is part of the New Testament plan of Jesus Christ. I'm afraid for you. And he didn't say, say uh, you're going to hell. And he said, I'm just afraid for you. Because if you continue on the path you're on, then I don't have a whole lot of confidence in where you're going. So I'm afraid for you lest I have labored for you in vain. I tried to save your soul. I tried to plant in you the gospel. I urge you to become just like I am. I urge you to become as I am for I am as you are. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity I preached the gospel to you at the first And he says, in my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise. Then then he asked this question, what then was the blessing you enjoyed? What did you get from the gospel? The original gospel gave them remission of sins, gave them a hope of everlasting, real things, very important things. And they obeyed the gospel originally because of that faith in Jesus Christ. And they had just like the people on the day of Pentecost, that original faith. We use that and stay with it and hold tight to it, brethren. We'll be okay. Let's not be tired of it. Let's stand for it. And let's be lights that hold forth that gospel. And tell the world, you've got to get on board Jesus with Jesus. And if you get on board with him, you'll do all right. He'll take you the right way. If you've never obeyed the gospel and need to tonight, and we can help you with that, we want you to be on the right track. And we want to help you all we can. We want you to help us all you can. So if you have need in any way to make your life right with